Hello and welcome to this game pickups video. Now it's actually been quite a long time since I've done one of these yet again. It seems like the gap between these videos is just getting bigger and bigger with each one I do. And uh, a big reason for that is just that I've not really been picking up too many games. I think there's been a little bit of a drought in new releases and to be honest it's kind of getting to a point where I've got pretty much all of the games that I want to have across all of the retro consoles too. Of course there are some like big ones that I'm still kind of looking for, uh, but a lot of the ones I'm still kind of like seeking out are really really expensive, uh, so I don't think I'll be picking up any of those like sort of bucket list games anytime soon. So this video is actually going to be covering every single physical game that I've picked up through the months of January, February, March and April 2022. Uh, so let's kick things off with the first game that I got, which I think came out in February, if I remember right. I could be wrong on that, it's been quite a long time. But it is, of course, Elden Ring for the PS5. Now this one is to be expected because, as a lot of people probably know, I'm a pretty big Soulsborne guy. Uh, in fact, I've got the Platinum Trophy on Dark Souls 1, 2 and 3, Bloodborne, uh, the Demon Souls remake, and I'm currently actually one trophy away from getting the Platinum on Sekiro as well. So yeah, you would think based on that, and based on the fact that I would probably say that Bloodborne in particular might be my favourite game of all time, you would assume that I would love Elden Ring. But the thing is, is that I've not actually properly gotten into this yet. I have played it for like a reasonable amount of time, I think I've played it for something like 30 hours now. Uh, but yeah, I'm just really struggling to actually gel with it properly, I'm not sure exactly why that is. Uh, I think a lot of it is to do with the fact that I'm not that big of an open world person. When there's like an open world in a game, that normally just immediately puts me off, because they tend to just be like either just big empty spaces, or everything that there is to do in them is just recycled content. Uh, and because of that, like, I never really tend to like them. Uh, so yeah, I think it's taken me quite a while to actually get to grips with just the overall design of Elden Ring, just based on that. I do have to admit that the bits in the game that are more linear and more like a traditional Dark Souls game, I've actually really enjoyed. Uh, like the section of the game where you're going through Stormvale Castle, for example. I really liked that section. Uh, but the more explorative elements, I don't know if I'm that much of a fan. To be honest, I could talk about Elden Ring for like an entire video, and I don't really know why I didn't do that closer to when it came out. I think maybe it's just because I don't want to put anything out there that I later look back on and completely disagree with. Uh, I actually didn't really gel all that well with Dark Souls 1 or Bloodborne when I first played them, and it took like a, a couple of like new characters and like replaying the beginning sections for it to really like click with me. Uh, so I'm thinking that it's going to be a similar situation with Elden Ring. Uh, I'm sure that if I like start again and like maybe go with a different build, um, maybe then it'll like sit better with me, I guess. But yeah, despite it being a really good game, I just don't think that I was in the right mindset to properly immerse myself in it. I think when I go back to it, I'm probably going to make a new character, start again, and try and get myself reintegrated into his world. But yeah, it's not that it's a bad game or anything, it just might be a case of it taking quite a while to properly get into it. Like I say, that same thing happened with Dark Souls 1 and Bloodborne, and they became two of my favourite games ever made. So, you never know, it might end up being the same with Elden Ring. The next game that I got is actually a little bit of a weird one, because it's a game that I technically all already have, and I purchased a second copy of it, and this mysterious game is Crash Team Racing for the PS1. And uh, the reason that I purchased a second copy of this is because when I was recording game footage for a video I did recently uh, about Mario Kart 8, uh, I wanted to refer back to Crash Team Racing, so I booted my copy of the game up and uh, recorded a little bit of footage. And little did I know that would be the last bit of footage I would ever get from it, because after entering the first race, it crashed, and uh, then the game just literally wouldn't launch after that. Uh, so yeah, I, with this being one of my favourite games ever made, 
I felt like I had to get another copy just because I need to have this game on hand because I tend to go back to it quite a lot. Uh, so yeah, that's a bit of a shame because the copy of it that broke was actually my childhood copy as well. Uh, this is my original case for the game because I did find a copy that was disc only. Uh, so yeah, I've reclaimed somebody else's disc and I'm now using that one because my old one broke. Uh, it's actually quite expensive, I think I paid £15, uh, which again was for the disc only, so yeah, PS1 games are really going up in price, aren't they? I remember when you could get this game for like £10 or less at one point. Uh, so yeah, if there's any PS1 games you want, you would better pick them up soon, because even the common ones like this are skyrocketing in price. Now this next game is one that I intended to pick up as soon as it came out, uh, but as soon as it released, it actually was hated by most people, and uh, all of that negative like attention kind of put me off of getting it. Uh, but relatively recently, I saw that it was on sale at a game, which is a well, is the kind of main game store in the UK. Uh, so yeah, I picked this game up for I think thirty-five pound when originally it was like fifty-five or something. And it is the Grand Theft Auto Definitive Edition Trilogy, or whatever it's called. I think it's Grand Theft Auto The Trilogy The Definitive Edition. It's got a stupid title, they should have just have called it Grand Theft Auto The Trilogy or something. Uh, but yeah, um, despite everybody hating this, uh, I actually think that it's pretty good from what I've played. I've only played like a around half of Grand Theft Auto 3. Uh, of course, you also get Vice City and San Andreas with this. Uh, but yeah, I've actually been quite enjoying it. It wasn't that long ago that I last played the original version of Grand Theft Auto 3, because at one point I was thinking about doing a review of it. Uh, so yeah, I actually played through uh, the whole first section of the original version, so it's pretty fresh in my mind. And the definitive edition for PS4 is definitely an improvement over that original version. Just being able to control the camera with the right analog stick is a massive improvement. Uh, because I think people forget that you couldn't even do that in the original version. Uh, moving the right analog stick actually sent you into like a first person camera mode where it like let you look around the world, I guess. Uh, but yeah, other features like having the weapon wheel and like uh, being able to switch radio stations more um, easily. And also just having the modern control setup where it's uh, R2 to accelerate and L2 to brake as well. All of those are pretty big features and uh, yeah, it was nice to see Grand Theft Auto 3 get modernised like that. I think the thing that people are complaining about the most with this is the graphics. And yeah, while they obviously could have done a way better job with like, if they were to go in the direction of like, remaking the games from the ground up. Uh, that would have obviously have been way better. Uh, but yeah, this is this is just a remaster, it's not a full-on remake. So I guess I can kind of excuse the graphics. It's almost like they've just taken the original game and just kind of like really, really upscaled everything. Uh, they've given it like light and effects that weren't there in the original version and stuff. Uh, and yeah, I think the it looks quite good in its own way, I think. Like, it still kind of looks like a PS2 game, but it's a PS2 game that has next-gen lighting and next-gen, like, effects and stuff, and I think it looks quite good. Uh, the one thing with this that I don't like, though, is the, I think even on the back of the box, yeah, it even says on the back of the box, Grand Theft Auto 5 style controls and targeting. That isn't true. It it doesn't have Grand Theft Auto V style targeting at all. I really wish it did though, because that's my biggest criticism with this. The shooting is just absolutely terrible. I would even probably go as far as to say that it's even worse in this than what it was in the originals. Uh, whereas, where in the originals you just kind of like held a button and it locked on, and then you pressed circle or whatever to shoot. It was kind of clunky, but it worked. With this, it kind of doesn't fully lock on, and it just feels like really floaty. And uh, yeah, it just feels horrible. I, I really wish that they had just added like a proper Grand Theft Auto V style aiming mode. I think that would have been way better. 
Uh, but yeah, they did do a pretty significant patch to this game, uh, which I had before I played it for the first time. So I imagine that that patch did fix a lot of the issues that people were complaining about when it first released. So maybe that's why I actually enjoyed my time with this. Uh, but yeah, didn't play it when it first came out, so I can't tell you. The next game we're talking about is the second to last one of the video, and it's the newest game in my entire collection at the moment. And quite surprisingly, it's actually for the Nintendo Switch. Uh, I feel like it's been quite a while since there's been any, like, major Switch games. Uh, there are a few coming out, of course, the main one being Splatoon 3, uh, that I'm hoping will be out soon. Uh, but yeah, the one we're talking about now is Kirby and the Forgotten World. Kirby and the Forgotten World? No, Kirby and the Forgotten Land. That's the name. So I've actually played quite a lot of this at this point. Uh, I've not finished it yet, and I know that there's quite a significant like post-game section that I've not experienced yet. Uh, but the reason that I've not played more of it is actually because my girlfriend has been playing through it kind of at the same time as me. Uh, so if it wasn't for that, I probably would have finished it by now. Uh, but yeah, it, this game is actually really good. I would go as far as to say that like in terms of like if I was to put it in some kind of like ranking in terms of Switch games, this would be up there among like the very very best. Uh, it wouldn't be, it's not like uh, in, on the same level as like Breath of the Wild or Super Mario Odyssey or anything. Uh, but it's up there with say the likes of like uh, Donkey Kong Tropical Freeze. Uh, and just stuff like that, like kind of the games that are really really good but not quite like that critically acclaimed if you know what I mean. But yeah, I mean the game is fairly straightforward, it's basically quite similar to Super Mario 3D World in terms of its structure. Uh, like you, you're on like this 3D world map and you enter levels and within the levels there's like a variety of collectibles and like different little objectives for you to complete. Um, and yeah, uh, those collectibles are actually used to unlock stuff in this big hub area called Waddle Dee Town. Uh, and as you get further into the game and rescue more Waddle Dees, the town gets bigger and bigger and they build more buildings there. And it gives you more to do, basically. So you start unlocking different mini-games, uh, like a battle arena. Uh, a thing where you can like upgrade all of the copy abilities in the game. Uh, so yeah, it's really really rewarding. I really like that aspect of it where like you constantly feel like you're upgrading yourself and you're constantly getting new things to do as well outside of playing the standard platforming levels. Even within the levels though, things feel quite varied. Uh, not only do you have the staple of Kirby's copy abilities where he can take in an enemy and like sort of steal their powers, uh, but you also have this new mouthful mode where Kirby can inhale a different inanimate object and sort of like use that object in different ways. Uh, so like he can kind of like half swallow a car and then he sort of like becomes the car driving around. Uh, he can take in a vending machine which lets him like fire like cans of soda out. Uh, so yeah, it's all pretty good stuff. There's always something new to see and it's always introducing new elements that keep it completely fresh. And it's also quite lengthy as well. Like I've been playing this game for quite a long time and I don't think I'm anywhere near finishing it. Uh, so yeah, you're getting a lot for your money with this one too. The final game of the video, and by far the most recent pickup, with me having got this probably less than a week ago at this point, is Alien Isolation for the PS4. Now this thing came out all the way back in 2014, which, thinking about it now, it's eight years ago, which is absolutely insane because this game feels so much newer than that. Like, it doesn't feel like that long ago that everybody was talking about this. Uh, but yeah, even now, all these years later, I'm pretty sure that this is regarded as being one of the best, if not the single best, Alien game. So for anybody that doesn't know what this is, it's basically set between the first Alien film and the second Alien film, and instead of following Ellen Ripley, who's the main character of those films, it actually follows her daughter, who in the films, uh, she's referenced in Aliens, which is the second film, uh, but it never really goes into any proper detail about who she is or anything. 
Uh, so to have this game fill in that blank is really, really interesting. And uh, yeah, this is the first time that I've ever actually played Alien Isolation as well, which is probably really weird because not only am I a big fan of horror games, which is what this is, uh, but I'm also a pretty big fan of Alien as well, in particular the first Alien, uh, and also Prometheus, which is the prequel that was made way, way after the original film. Uh, but yeah, I'm a pretty big fan of the series as a whole, even if I do think it kind of goes off the rails a little bit by the time we get to Alien 3 and Resurrection. Uh, but yeah, this game so far is pretty good. I would say it's it's really good if you're a fan of Alien, because it does follow the first Alien film in terms of the whole like vibe of the game. Uh, like, it is straight up a horror game in the same way that the first film was a horror film. Uh, and there's only, as far as I'm aware anyway, there's only one alien in this game, just like with the first film. Uh, so yeah, they were definitely taking more cues from the first film than any of the sequels, which I personally love. So one of the main criticisms I have of this game uh, is in the way that it is somewhat dated by today's standards. It kind of goes for that thing where there's one central antagonist who's following you throughout the entire game. Uh, sort of in the same way as Mr. X does in the Resident Evil 2 remake. Uh, but obviously in Alien Isolation, it's the alien. And although I do think it's interesting how the alien isn't, like, scripted as much as a typical game enemy would be, like, the alien is sort of, like, random in the way that it stalks you. Like, sometimes it will be hiding in the vents. Sometimes it will just be, like, walking around, uh, like, more actively looking for you, I guess, and being more aggressive. Uh, but the issue with that is that sometimes you'll be trying to do, like, an objective, or you'll be trying to even just get to the objective that you're supposed to be doing. And because it's so, like, sort of linear, and claustrophobic, and it's all like a series of hallways that are kind of maze-like. Sometimes you'll go, you'll get yourself into these situations where the alien is just straight up blocking your path. There's only one way to get to this objective, and the alien is just walking up and down the hallway, and there's just nothing that you can do about it. Um, and that that can be quite frustrating because you kind of, I kind of wish that in a way it was a little bit more scripted so that the alien kind of, like, went into different sections of the level more often, because it can sometimes just feel like the alien is just constantly right next to you, and it doesn't give you the opportunity to properly explore. Like, pretty much every level that I've done so far that's featured the alien, I've not even bothered trying to collect everything, just because it's not worth the risk of getting killed by the alien and potentially losing a load of in-game progress. Uh, but yeah, a lot of things that I like about the game, but I do wish that they had made it so the alien kind of buggered off a little bit more and went into another section. Because it kind of just feels a little bit unfair, it kind of just feels like the alien always knows where you are to a certain degree. And I, I don't really know if I like that, I kind of feel like it, I kind of feel like it should have been a little bit more openly designed in terms of, like, the alien could be on the other side of the map. Uh, so you weren't constantly thinking that the alien was going to be killing you, like, all the time, if you know what I mean. But yeah, there we have it. They're the five games that I've picked up over the last four months. And I don't know if one of them counts, really, because it was uh, a game that I already actually had, and I just had to re-buy it because my disc broke. So technically four new games in this video over the four months, which averages out at one game a month, uh, which isn't very many, uh, considering the in these past in the some of the past videos I've gotten significantly more than that. Uh, but like I said at the beginning of the video, there's just not been that many new releases that I've been interested in. And, um, yeah, there's not really that many older games that I'm interested in getting either at this point. In fact, to be honest, more recently, I've been spending significantly more money on buying books uh, than what I have been buying games. And it's kind of why I started doing the Pixels Book Club series, because I kind of wanted to talk about that a little bit more, seeing as that's what I've been spending my time doing recently. 
And yeah, since the last episode of that, I've probably read enough books to do a third episode. Uh, so yeah, you can expect to see that coming soon if you're interested in anything that I talk about in that series. But yeah, to wrap things up here, uh, definitely let me know in the comments what games you've been getting recently. And let me know if there's any like new games that I should know about, because like I say, I've just not been interested in anything recently. Uh, so yeah, it'd be interesting if there was some like quite like obscure like indie games that I've been missing out on or anything. Uh, so yeah, let me know if you uh, know of anything like that. Uh, also, of course, give the video a like if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to see more stuff like this coming soon. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye!